Welcome to War Gaming Recon. I am your host, Jonathan J. Reinhardt. War Gaming Recon is the only member of the TSR Podcast Network to discuss historical and New England gaming. This is a very, very special episode 192. We are delighted to say that I have my buddy and co-host, Adrian Benson, with me. Adrian, how are you today? Hey, John. I'm doing great. Thanks. And Adrian, I bet you are as enthused as I am because this episode 192 has a very special title because we have an incredible guest that I am delighted to have. The episode is called Sam Mustafa Game Designer, and we're going to talk about all sorts of stuff on this show. I don't expect you to remember it all. Don't worry. we got show notes. You can find those at wargamingrecon.com slash WR192. That's wargamingrecon.com slash WR192. So I want to introduce our guest. He is a well-respected historian. He's a professor. He's a published author. But we know and love him best because he's a game designer of a fantastic series of games that we have dived into over many past few years. And we started with Maurice and LaSalle, and we moved forward with Aurelian. And by now, I hope you know who I'm talking about. I'm referring to the one and only Mr. Sam Mustafa. Sam, how are you today? Hello, thanks for having me. I have to say, I am so, so excited that you're here <laughs> because uh, we've talked about you for, even before Adrian came on the show, uh, which was, what, three, four years ago, Adrian? Uh, four years, I think, yeah. And, and we would play your games and uh, our friends would say, so there's this game designer, you got to like check him out. And so we start playing and we're like, this is really awesome. And I thought to myself, someday it would be great if I could get him on the show, but I didn't think that would happen, and here you are. So I am, I'm chuffed. A mere 192 episodes later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because I don't know how much you know about the show, but the show's been around a long time. It's the longest running tabletop podcast, a uh, wargaming podcast, in existence. And so we, I, I, I did know that. Yeah. It, we do it for just whatever, but it's really come into its own. I would say within the past five to seven years. Oddly, about the time I came on board, I don't know if that's related <laughs> at all. I, I don't know. It, it must be your winning personality, Adrian. I think that's what it is. People just love seeing you. They're like, that Jonathan guy, forget him. But Adrian, he's who we want. <sighs> so, Sam, you've created a whole lineup of games, and I know I've missed a few. Why don't you walk us through what some of the games are that you've created? Sure. Um, I, I've been doing games. I've been creating games ever since I was a kid. Um, and then in my early 20s, I started um, self-publishing, you know, in the back in the days of dot matrix printers and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and, you know, stapled rule books and so on. But most people who know my stuff outside the U.S. would know it from about 2002. Uh, and that's when I published a game called Grand Armée. And that was uh, published by Quantum Printing. And then the success of that kind of brought me to um, a wider audience around the world. And that inspired me to create this game label called Honor. Um, pardon me. <clears throat> Sorry, I've got water beside the table here in the event of emergencies. <laughs> um, so uh, sort of about 2005 or so, I've been self-publishing and I've had um, a small company and I'm, I'm basically a one-man show. You know, I've, I've done eight games under that label um, and I write, of course, and I, I stage the playtesting events um, with the different groups. Uh, I handle the, the, the layout, the, pub, you know, the, the, the printing, the shipping, uh, everything. I've got people who help me with almost all those things, but essentially... <clears throat> um, I am the business, right? So um, uh, since, I guess it's been about 12 years now, uh, I've been doing that. That's and if I, I guess awesome. in order, <clears throat> those games would be Might and Reason, La Salle in 2009, um, then Maurice, then Longstreet, um, then Blücher, then Aurelian, then Free Jumper, and as of yesterday, Rommel. Why don't we um, talk a little bit, actually, to expand on the games that you've done. Why don't we talk a little bit about your game design, uh, how you uh, approach it, your preferences, your game design philosophy, because uh, all of your games kind of share a core, um, a core, really. You can take any of them, and you see that there's this common thread amongst all of your systems that you've used. And I would say it's, it's a winning uh, formula that you use, but yet they're all 
very much of their time period and of their conflict. Uh, you, you've done it quite well. Well, thank you. Well, um, <clears throat> I don't really have a conscious method. I mean, I'm aware that um, what I do kind of takes a pattern. I, I guess the first thing I should say is that um, for every game that gets published, there's probably seven or eight that never do, right? They're, they're, they might only make it you know, in, you know, among our friends. We might play it two or three times saying, nah, this isn't working. Or it might work just fine, but it's not a feasible project to invest a lot of money in and time and so on to publish it. But of the ones that do, or I guess just in general, I begin with um, uh, a theme or a concept, you know, a topic I want to do. And then I think about what kind of playing experience I want. So for example, I might say, and this is purely conjecture, um, let's do a game about hunting U-boats in the North Atlantic in World War II, and I want it to be a card game. <clears throat> because I want the players to be constantly interacting, playing cards and hunting and searching for each other and things like that. So I begin with some sort of concept like that and <clears throat> with a with a design experience, I mean, with a playing experience that I want the design to convey. And then from there, it could go anywhere. You know, a lot of the games that do get published end up in a form that's very different from the originally conceived form. You know, Rommel, for example, two years ago, um, was a game without any sort of areas, and now it's this area movement game, where you know the 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 players place terrain and figures and so on in these uh, these area these discrete areas on the board. That was not part of the original design. The original design maybe kind of had cards, doesn't anymore. So a lot of things can change during play testing, and some of those changes have to do with just whether or not it works, but others have to do with whether or not it's marketable. In the case of Rommel, for example. Um, the the dealers were telling me, oh, I don't know if we want to stock cards. Can you do the game without cards? And I thought, well, yeah, actually we could. And went back and the playtesters liked it better without cards, actually. We, we came up with some different mechanics. So there's not a set of there's not a set of laws or rules that I go by. I think that if there's a core to these things that, <clears throat> in reference to what you said, it's simply that I, I'm always trying to make whatever whatever subsystem or, or mechanic of the game as simple as possible. Uh, I say this a lot, and I, I don't know if uh, people are sick of hearing this or if they don't uh, believe me, but it's really, really hard to make something simple. Um, <clears throat> it's easy to design a complicated game. You can just get a whole bucket of things you want in the game and just pour them into a game design, make up a big sequence of play, and they're all in there. That's that's easy. But to to distill the game down to its essential components and to get everything interconnected and as simple as possible, that takes a lot of work. And I'd say 50% to 70% of the play testing is devoted to that. Hmm. Well, I believe that. I mean, it's like when you write, you can write at length, but to really be able to get rid of all that extra stuff that you don't need, that's where the, a lot of the time and the effort comes in. So it has to be the same way as what you're referring to with your game design. It is, and and I think that because I'm a writer, you know, I write I write books for a living as well as you know uh, designing games and so on. I, I I think probably that helps. I'm a I'm a relentless um, revisionist. You know, I, I go back and I and I go back and I go back and I read the same thing over and over and over. And um, I, I do have a ritual in the sense that the, the morning after I've written something, I spend that morning looking at it again, and often what I thought was brilliant the night before needs to be fixed here and here and here and here. <laughs> So Adrian actually is who I like to refer to as our rules guy because, uh, Adrian, you kind of have this propensity to just absorb rules and the mechanics and kind of dive down uh, deep into them. So when we contacted you, Sam, not well, it doesn't feel that long ago, um, for us to review Aurelian, uh, I immediately said, okay, I've got to give it to Adrian. And Adrian, what were your first thoughts about uh, Aurelian when we dived into that? Uh, my first thoughts when I read through the rules, Aurelian is actually a bit different from the game that actually got me hooked on the Honor series was Maurice. I love Maurice. Um, I love the it, the card system, which I'm not a huge fan of card-driven games, I have to be honest, but in Maurice, the, uh, the, the card system really does a great job of recreating the uh, command friction. And I love the fact that in a game that's designed around the Seven Years' War period, you can't you can never get all of your troops moving at once, which of course they weren't able to do. And most games that re simulate that period don't really do a good job of, of uh, 
showing that, but Maurice does. Anyway, I love Maurice. That's what got me hooked on the uh, the Honor series. But uh, when I read through Aurelian the first time, um, it's a fair bit different. I mean, just first of all, the fact there was no dice kind of threw me off. Um, and then reading through the rules, just reading through the rules and the, uh, the way the combat mechanics works, where you can kind of decide based on the card that you play, what your combat result is most likely going to be. I was like, I'm not sure I really even want to play this or I'm going to like it. I just, it seemed like everything was kind of sort of going to be predetermined. Um, so John can tell you when we first sat down to play test it or uh, review it, I was like, I wasn't totally thrilled with it until we played it. And then it was, it was, it was great. It worked much better than it read. I guess I would say um, I really enjoyed the game. Um, we did a few things wrong the first time we played through it. Uh, that was John's fault, but things a lot. He didn't print enough card. We didn't have enough cards. So the first time we played through it, it was kind of uh, it didn't work very well. But then the the, the other times were like um, I really enjoy the mechanic of deciding what card you're going to play and how kind of how the combat result is going to go based on that. It's it's not at all it's not at all the way I thought it was going to be. I was like. Every time you go into combat, you're going to know for sure if you're going to win or lose, and you don't. It doesn't. It doesn't. No. Play, doesn't play the way I, it reads. Yeah, thank you. I I did a couple of demos of that game at convention um, for for individual publishers and so on um, back when that, we were some flirting a little bit with having it published as a board game, and I was I was demoing the game to some publishers, and I didn't tell them there were no dice until after the game is done, and the game plays in about an hour and a half or something like that. Yeah. And at the end, I, I asked for their feedback, and I said, first of all, did you notice there's no dice? And in every single case, they said, they sort of scratched their head and go, oh, right. <laughs> oh, there was no dice. Um, and I'm very, I'm very proud of Aurelian. I think Aurelian is my, my neglected brilliant child because um, it's, it's commercially the least successful game I did, I, partly because it's only a PDF, right? People don't right. take a game seriously unless it's got a book. Um, but I knew it was a sort of a small topic and I didn't want to sink a bunch of money into printing a book. Yeah. But um, it's, only, it's only played by a couple hundred people in the entire world, but I love it. I, I think it's a system that's, uh, it's got a lot of um, possibilities and I'm not, I haven't totally ruled out the possibility of using it again for some other period. Yeah. Um, because I, I just love how, that metaphorically the the mechanic is you're running out of luck right as, as the yeah. game goes on you've got these cards with different values and you can choose to hang on to them or play them you don't know what the other guy is going to play so there is some randomization of course right uh, a lot of randomization but uh if you do use up your good stuff early you are literally running out of luck yeah yeah it's 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 an awesome system i went from like yeah I'd, i'll play it but i don't want it to i really love it so yeah, we, we we're, we'll be playing a lot. I may even go so far as to paint up an army for it. I that was one of the that was the one of the big appeals for it was ancients is a it's not really my primary period of interest. I'm more of an American Civil War Napoleonic World War II guy. I like ancients, but I never wanted to invest the money in in miniatures and the time in painting them. But then we had the opportunity to give this a shot, and it's like all right, we'll give it a try. But now I love it. It's a great game. I, I'm surprised that it's not as not more popular than you say it is. I mean, it is a fairly narrow topic. It just right, right. I, I think a lot of ancient games, maybe even all of them, with just a few exceptions, um, they they tend to cover this period from Moses to Columbus. You know, there, yeah. there's this vast array of possible armies. You can and, and in many of those games, they're they're sort of indifferent to historical or geographic matchup. You know, you could have your Egyptians fighting Vikings or your, your you know, Henry VIII versus the Samurai or something like that. Um, whereas Aurelian picks you know, about 80 years of history and just zeroes in on that. And uh, I think people assumed that, well, you know, I don't have any Sassanid Persians or you know, Middle Romans or whatever, therefore it's not for me. But of right. course, that's why I gave them the, the unit cards as well. You know, you can, you can just, you don't need miniatures, you can plop down the unit cards and play with those. Exactly. Uh, most, the last time I played it, in fact, we didn't use, min I have miniatures for it, but we didn't use them. We just, because um, I, was, I was traveling at the time and I, I met up with some gamers who are friends of mine in Berlin and we just, well, you know, we just plopped it right down and played. Um, and I won. I almost never win that game. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's funny. Adrian, you kind of surprised me, though, saying that you might want to paint up minis for it because 
Um, for me, part of the appeal is that you don't need minis. And in fact, I have um, I have 170 second scale ancient Romans and I'm getting rid of them in part because of Aurelian because I'm like, the, the unit tiles are so good. And, and for me, there's no need to have the minis for this game. And, and it actually kind of reminds me way, way back, I think it was 2014, Sam, you wrote a, a column for War Game Soldiers and Strategy Magazine. And you talked about how, um, I, not that I expect you to remember, but at the time you talked about how you kind of surprised in your gaming circle at how few people are painting miniatures, including people who are longtime painters. And yeah. I remember reading that column of yours and thinking, this is something I need to talk about. So we actually talked about it, um, used you as inspiration, talked about it on an episode of the show 113, where uh, I posited the question, are painted minis essential to miniatures wargaming? And I came out and said, no, that they're not essential, it, which was very controversial, as you can imagine, and probably maybe is with you as well. But I, I love that how I think probably at the time you were doing the column, you may have been thinking about doing uh, Free Jumper and Aurelian. And I might be wrong on the timeline. Yeah, oh. I was actually thinking about doing Bleacher. Oh, really? Okay. So yeah. no, Bleacher, Bleacher was the first game that I did that had the unit cards. Um, and, and, and specifically because I, I think in that column I referenced Napoleon or horse and musket, I think it was not just Napoleonics, but hmm. the, I was, I was talking about the trend of games to, to go down to a sort of skirmish level where you only need a few dozen figures and to, to play in a very small table. And I said, for, for people like me who are really interested in the horse and musket period, that's, that's kind of a non-starter. I mean, there's only so much skirmishing you can do in the seven years war and you don't really want to play you know, a big horse and musket game with 20 figures on the table, it would look ridiculous trying to do water only with 20 figures. So I was pondering, what if you were to flip this around? You know, many games have lots of figures and then a few markers. What if you were to have lots of markers and a few figures? You, know, you could have a really gorgeous figure to be Wellington or Napoleon or whatever. And then some sort of marker, like a board game, could, could stand in for the figures. And if you do that, you could lower the bar to entry for a new player. And one of the things that puts off new, new players in Horse and Musket is just how many figures they have to, to buy and paint in a really fancy way, right? To look good, Horse and Musket figures take a lot of investment and a lot of work. So what if you could introduce these, you know, these um, unit cards instead and just have literally in your hand an army, throw it down in five minutes, and that's, that's what I did. So in some ways, um, the accessories to Belisha have sold better than, than the game itself because people mm -hmm. use them not just for Belisha but for other Napoleonic games. Yeah, I can believe it. I, with Aurelian, I thought the same thing. I was like, well, do you know, we'll use the unit tiles and we'll use it actually for um, a, another Ancients war game. Uh, and we'll just use that because we, we'll, we won't actually have to paint the minis that uh, Adrian, you bought and I have. We'll just use these. And then we actually started looking at it we're like, forget that let's just let's play the game and, and so we asked you about the game and then we played the game and i just i love how deceptively simple it is because adrian like you said you look at it and you think okay this this is what you got to do but you don't really know like you right. at the that's why i think it's so important when people play games and they look at rules and stuff before they start spreading off opinions you need to actually play the game you can't just look at the rules and be like okay i read the rules once and it, this yeah. is what it means. Well, no, you don't know what it means. Like, get at the table and play, and play a few times, and then see what you think it means. Yeah, I'm not going to name names, but um, I, I, I don't <laughs> I need the fingers. I don't need the fingers of one hand to count the number of reviews I've gotten from someone who played the game. Right. I mean, mo almost all the written reviews I've received in magazines and so on are just from some somebody flipping through the book. Oh yeah, that's. Yep. I, I was, I was going to offer two things, if I may, real quickly about just things that I love in games and things that I try to do in, in, uh, in game design in general. Um, one is to uh, emphasize the different kinds of randomness that you can have. Many people, I think, design games or play games in which everything is known except the die roll. Yeah. So you know exactly when your next phase for shooting is. You know exactly what the sequence is, when the enemy can do this. You know exactly how far you can move in the trees and whatever. And then well, to give it a little bit of randomness, we throw a die roll on at the end of that process. I love trying to inject randomness um, into every aspect of, of the game without clunking up the game if, if possible, which, which brings me to the second point, and that is if you can try to have the players constantly interacting um, in the sequence, 
uh, or better yet, with no sequence at all. You know, let them decide by interrupting and modifying and whatever, and playing their opportunities against each other. Then natural randomness takes over, because yes, I know you've got cards, and I can even look over there and see you've got four, and I've got six, so I know I've got more than you. But I don't know what you've got, and I don't know what you've got in mind. I don't know. You may have a tremendous card, but you don't want to use it. But I have no way of knowing that. So just just because I have an opponent and I can't know what he's going to do, there's randomness. Therefore, the more interaction you have between the players, the less, the less that you chain them to a sequence, the more randomness the game has. And that's why in Aurelian, for example, um, because we're constantly interrupting each other and because I don't know what you're going to do next or how you're going to modify it or how many actions you're going to take and so on, even with no dice whatsoever, there's tons of randomness. Yeah. Yeah, there was, and it was very refreshing. Like I said, I was expecting a completely predetermined outcome with not a whole lot of tactical options, and both of those opinions were completely wrong. So, I was say, well, I wasn't completely surprised because I thought to myself, Adrian, you have to be wrong because, and you're going to think I'm just saying it in the brown nose, but it's true. At the time, I thought, okay, Sam has created a bunch of games, and they're very popular. So if this was all it was, he wouldn't be having the success that he has. So there has to be something we're missing. And I didn't know what it was, but I knew there had to be something more. And I was like, but maybe I'm wrong because I've been wrong many times in my life and will be again. And so I, I know, feel free to chime in here. So I, I thought, okay, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt, Adrian. And let's just, let's just play. Let's play the game and we'll see. And we'll get to the table. And I'm glad we did. We played many times, which is we one did, of yeah. my kind of unofficial roles for anything we're going to do and talk about on the show, especially a review. Mm -hmm. Like I really want us to throw ourselves at it and see how it is and so i think we played aurelian more than we played any other one single game system in the past what six months or a year uh well except possibly bold action but uh yeah we played it a lot in, in, well thank, in thank, you. thank you I, I do reserve the right to screw up from time to time um <laughs> But <clears throat> I, I will say that it's, I'm always amused that people ask me, you know, was this play tested? <laughs> what do you think? No, I just banged it out and threw it out there. Yeah. <laughs> you, you wanted to throw that money at it and put it out, knowing it might not be great, <laughs> and just see what happens. Oh, my God. That is funny. But uh, people, they feel free to tell you anything. They really do. <laughs> Good, bad, whatever. You get it all, I'm sure. It's yeah, I, like I, I have to be careful because I, I among my friends, um, I do share sort of the you know, War Gamer's Greatest Hits album of crazy things people say to me or ask me or, or sometimes just incredibly stupid things that you know, I get I get thrown at me in emails and, and whatnot. And I, I really probably shouldn't broadcast those in case the guy who just wrote it 10 minutes ago <laughs> is, is watching your podcast. We did a thing once about... Um... And I tell you, we got more feedback about that than anything else. So we did an episode, and we told people ahead we wanted feedback for this or content uh, on pet peeves that listeners have about game conventions. <laughs> and yeah. I tell you, I had to edit and redact a lot of stuff because there was like, so and so does this, and at this convention, and like I like I don't want to embarrass anyone, but like the the core concept was important. So I'd be like, sometimes at conventions. Right. This might happen. <laughs> and don't do that. You got to generalize. But it was funny. And we're still getting comments from people about things that we should do, like a, a part two and part three, because we got some. You could do a whole series. Don't. But you could do a whole series on the things people tell you. There's apparently quite a few pet peeves out there. Who knew? You could probably do a, a game, Sam, just of all the ways that people think your game should be played and like a parody kind of game. <laughs> and I bet it would sell well. Well, the, you know, once you buy the game, it's yours. Right, and I, I I tell people this all the time: do whatever you want. You know, you it's you paid your money; it's your toy. You know, play with it however you want. You will not break my heart. Um, <clears throat> what what baffles me, and I, I get this often actually: someone will flip through it once, not having yet played it, or maybe play a turn or two, and then print this long Jeremiah or send me an email about how everything is wrong and how it you know really needs to be changed to this 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 and this. Um, and start this long thread um, on the website, and I, and I've never known what they what exactly they expect me to do. I mean, do you really expect me to say, "Oh my God, Jonathan, Eureka!" I mean, I, I stop the presses, return all the books now. I'm going to officially <laughs> amend the rules to make sure that your suggestion is now official. And because I have such power, you know, spreading around the world. 
you know, I, I can I can mandate that everyone now play it the way that you want to. Right? What are they thinking? Um, <clears throat> they, they, I always respond by saying, well, you know, play however you like, and they, that's not the answer they want to hear. No. They, they, they want to hear me say, wow, you're right. Um, I'm officially changing the game as of now based on your suggestion. I, it happens every single time. If only I were as brilliant as you, then I too could be a great game designer. I'm sorry, that's a little... But I know what you mean. It's it, it's hard trying to figure out the proper way to respond to that kind of stuff. And you... I mean, you put yourself out there, right? You, you make all your games, you do all the stuff, and, and you write and everything. So you, you're getting it from every which way of people saying they like it, they don't, and they just... They unload. And I always say that constructive criticism is great, but it has to be constructive. Yeah, and when when you get that, those are the guys you want to hire as playtesters. Absolutely. Right. I mean, for the next one. <clears throat> and, and many of the playtesters are guys who, who gave me some grief about a previous game. And I thought, hmm, this, this guy is smart. This this guy has some good you know, observational skills. Let the, let's recruit this guy. Yeah. Why don't we talk a little bit about your so-called next game, um, which really is the next because it just came out, Rommel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you had alluded to it earlier that Rommel's very different, uh, not just because of how it morphed in game design, but you have this whole area effect kind of game. Uh, why don't you explain a little bit about Rommel? Because I'm sure not all of our listeners are familiar with the game, uh, although they should be. And uh, just a little bit about why you created it and, and how it works and how they can get a hand, their hands on it. Sure. Um... So I've always liked World War II uh, as a gaming period, like I guess most people. Um, but I'm not a huge skirmish gamer guy. I mean, for me, um, having just a handful of figures on the table is sort of unsatisfying. And I'm also I'm not that good at tactics. So you know, I'm, I'm not the guy you want to ask, you know, how should we best take the church steeple and knock out that German MG42? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, so I've always wanted a, a bigger scale World War II game. And there, if you think about it, um, typically that's something for board games, right? I mean, there are very few miniatures or tabletop operational scale World War II games. I, I think I could name maybe two in the past quarter century. Nice. So I, I've always known I wanted to do that. It got delayed by other projects for a while. It had a different name for a while. And some of the early playtest versions didn't work very well. But I finally decided that... Um, in 2016, this was the year I was going to do it, and um, that's when we began working on it. And it became obvious pretty quickly that it needed to be area-based. There's a couple of reasons for that. Um, first of all, when you're doing relatively large-scale, I guess any scale World War II gaming, you, you need some way to show combined arms operations. You, you, you need to do so in a way that's different from horse and musket. In the horse and musket period, um, combined arms is about different branches of the army being in proximity to one another. The infantry is here, the cavalry is nearby, the artillery is firing in support, but they're not really intermixed. Yeah. But in World War II, they are. Uh, you can easily imagine that company of infantry being supported by a platoon of tanks, for example, yeah. um, or those, those, those self-propelled anti-aircraft guns you know, in Normandy moving along the column with the German tanks in case the Allied fighters jump them or something like that. So that's hard to do in a traditional tabletop game where you've got rulers and open tabletop because the figures have to be somewhere on the table, right? And you know, you, if you're going to have an infantry base and a tank base representing an infantry unit and an armor unit, you could put them side by side, I suppose, one on the left and one on the right. But then what happens if the infantry base is partially in the woods, but the tank isn't? If you attack that unit, which one are you attacking? Are you attacking them both? And if so, does that mean the tank is also in the woods, even though he's not really in the woods? Uh, it's really hard. You have to write a, a zillion rules to, um, to cover what it really means to be mixed together as a single unit, unless you have areas. So it just worked really well to have an area-based game uh, at the scale where an area is basically one kilometer means that whatever you put in that area is a combined arms team just by definition. That's the terrain. There's no debate as to what terrain they're in. It's right there. There's no debate as to who is in what kind of terrain. Everybody in that area is in that terrain. There's no question as to what the attacker is doing. If he's attacking you, he must also be in that terrain. Now, one kilometer is a pretty good engagement distance. Um, even for tank guns, it's, it's kind of long distance for the, you know, just the limits of the human eyeball at that, at that range. 
Um, and then there's no issues with things like, am I being flanked? Well, you know, the right fender of the, of the Sherman tank is just across the front line. So you're kind of being flanked, but maybe not roll it. There's none of that. Um, there's no question where an artillery barrage lands. It's in that area, nowhere else. There's no putting down a template and saying, well, I can pivot it this way and squeeze one more of your mortar bases under the template. <laughs> there's no question where an airstrike is happening. There's no question where the supplies are coming from. There's no question where your headquarters is. So areas simplify the game massively. Yeah. Um, it takes another five to 10 minutes to set up at start because you, if you don't have something with areas already marked, you need some little pebbles or something, just put little pebbles to make corners and that takes about five or 10 minutes. Once you do, it shaves about an hour off the playing time because you wow. don't need to measure. Um, anything you just you just count the areas artillery ranges become very simple and very straightforward where you can move is super simple um, it, It's a remarkable streamlining that allows us to put the detail of the game elsewhere um, The way board games often do and for, for those people who are sort of tabletop game and miniatures game purists who think ah pop board game I've got board games in my closet if I want to play a board game I play a board game well, so what? <laughs> you know, you're playing a game, right? Games have playing pieces. Games have a surface. I, I really don't care personally whether that playing piece is a counter or a miniature. I use whatever looks good with the game I'm playing. I'm agnostic when it comes to what my playing piece is. Um, but the experience of the game matters a lot to me. Is it fun to play? Is it challenging? Does it feel good? And uh, so I want the best possible experience. And I am not above stealing from board games or stealing from anything to, to make a nice hybrid like that. Yeah, I'm kind of excited about Rommel because, I mean, you're right. I can't really think of any operational level World War II games. I guess the only one that might be available right now, I'm not super familiar with it. I've never read it or anything, but there's a, a series of games called Battle Group, like Battle Group Curse, Battle Group. Mm -hmm. That might that might be the only other kind of example. No, they're, they're skirmish games. They're very small. Oh, they are. Yeah, one one vehicle is one tank. Um, yeah. Well, then then I can't think of any. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm more of a skirmish and maybe company level style gamer myself. But this one, yeah, I'm excited about this one. There actually aren't that many operational level miniatures games of any period. I mean, there's there's a few for Napoleonics, um, maybe one or two for Horse and Musket, Seven Years War, but not that many. So it's it's kind of an interesting thing to bring to the miniatures tabletop. Not a lot of people even try it. Yeah, we do one unit is roughly a company in Rommel. Yeah. And that, you know, I, I say roughly to hedge my bets because, you know, if you're playing Eastern Front in 1944, for instance, it's probably a battalion because right? both sides have such manpower shortages by that point. Um, and, you know, it's probably a company that's also been reinforced. It's probably got some anti-tank guns. It's probably got some anti-aircraft guns and some mortars and you know, heavy weapons platoon or something like that. Yeah. So somewhere between 100 and 200 men um, is a unit. And that allows you, if you've got, you know, I don't know, two or three guys on a side and some big space and a, you know, a big table or a convention or whatever, you can do a really serious battle at that scale. You know, you could, we did, yeah. we did about half of Market Garden uh, just during playtesting, you know, the American part of the corridor. Um, mm -hmm. But you could do the Normandy landings. There's, no, there's nothing preventing you. Um, one of the playtest scenarios we did, which I'll probably put up for free on the web soon, is um, Juno Beach. So, you know, we did the whole Canadian landing at Juneau Beach and the, the counterattack of the 21st Panzer Division and all of that. And you could do that in two hours. That's that's a walk in the park. Uh, that would be great. I'd, either flank of Kursk, you could probably do with that scale. It would mm -hmm. be great. Yeah, that would be great. So I haven't ordered it yet, but if I can get on the website today, I'm going to. So Website's <laughs> fixed. <laughs> <laughs> my, my customers crashed the website yesterday, but uh, it's fixed. That's a great problem to have. I mean, not that you want it to happen, but like because people love your stuff so much that they they're flooding you. That's pretty cool. Well, it was it was a hair raising four hours on, on customer support. That's for sure. No doubt. So for for the game, just correct me if I'm wrong. For the playing surface, it, it's something that works best with a gridded or hexed surface. The um, in the advanced game, there's a uh, some provisions for using hexes if you prefer. Okay. Um, but I, I didn't want to mandate hexes because relatively few people have a hex grid tabletop surface available. And if I said you've got to use hexes, I'd drive off 90% of the customers. Yeah. Anybody can make squares. Um, all you do is you, you, you lay out your, your green 
cloth on the table and take some pebbles from your backyard and make corners out of them. Right? You just you put every six inches, you put a pebble and within you know, five minutes later, you've got a square table grid. So like I have a bunch of cigar box battle mats because I love mm. their stuff and they are just amazing people, um, but none of them have any sort of grid on it. So like you said, I could just go get get pebbles, could get twigs, whatever, uh, pieces of paper and, and just kind of put that in and you're okay. Like you don't need anything fancy done. In order to sure. Um, and by the way, Cigar Box does now have Rommel mats. Um, they do, yeah. Uh, they we, do. I, I did see that. Uh, they were they announced them yesterday uh, on their website. And uh, two of them are in the photos of the book, a, a four-inch square and a six-inch square version. So you can scale up or scale down the game if you want to go really big. For Market Garden, we did four-inch squares, so we can have that long road corridor. Yeah. Um, but you don't have to do corners. You, you could do terrain features, for example. If you imagine a square that has a center point, Right. Imagine drawing an X from the corners, right? And in the center point, um, put something, a tree, for instance, that's a wooded square. Or put a little house, that's an urban square. Or just put a rock and that's an open square. So um, you can do it without any, if grids offend your eyes, you can use terrain pieces instead and just move from terrain piece to terrain piece. That's pretty cool. And for this, are you recommending that people use minis? Are you suggesting uh, print and play kind of models, uh, unit tiles? Like, what's the general feeling for that? Well, you, we did play tests with both. Um, it depends on how much time we had to set up. You know, I'm, I'm taking the game to a local hobby store in a couple of weeks, and I'm going to bring miniatures, obviously, because they, they look cool. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't have time, um, you know, most of the time spent in miniatures games is setting up miniatures and, and then taking down miniatures you can just print off the unit cards uh, and play with them as playing pieces. And, and when we were pressed for time during playtest, we did that a lot. We had a big North Africa game, um, Brits versus Italians in, in 1940. And, and we just we just didn't bother. I didn't have that many Italian figures and not, nobody in our group did. So we just played with the, with the unit cards. However, um, I've sized the cards to be about two inches wide. So if you have 15 millimeter World War II figures, and a lot of guys do for popular games like you know, Battle Group or Flames of War or whatever, then they fit right under those bases and can stick out like a label. So all you need to know is what you're looking at. Um, you know, this, you know, this company is guys in half trucks belongs to the 21st Panzer Division or whatever. You just you need to know that in some way. And if you don't feel like marking your your figure bases, um, or trying to remember them all in a big game, just use the unit cards as labels like we did in Blue Cure. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty sweet. And I think I found a new use for my Flames of War models. Oh, well, you know, I assume, I'm, I'm a Flames of War player. I have been for years, ever since first edition. And um, I assume that a lot of guys who would try Rommel had armies about that size. So if you've got, what, what Flames of War calls an army is already a reinforced company. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a company with yeah. lots of extra gadgets and doodads um, because they're cool because you know, you got to have a flame throwing tank or whatever. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> but if, you, if you've got a force of that size, like for example, if you, I have a German Panzer Grenadier force for, for Flames of War, mm -hmm. um, I think everyone does, right? Uh, it, now I've got a Panzer Division, right? That, in Rommel's scale, that is the 17th Panzer Division. Hmm. That's pretty cool. That's awesome, yeah. Yeah, we've got uh, we've each got armies for Flames of War. I haven't played Flames of War in quite a while, but um, yeah, definitely been looking for use for those. We've done some other company level games, but yeah, I'm looking forward to giving this one a try. Yeah, I have a, a Panzer company, and it's been sitting there because I, I love painting the models, but just I kind of moved away from the game, and I was like, "What should we do?" And we talked about uh, Chain of Command. Was that uh, one of the ones we were talking about, Adrian? I ain't been shot, Mom. I've played that a lot. Um, yeah. That's actually a really fun company-level World War II game. But yeah. But this sounds delightful. Um, how can people get their hands on it? You mentioned your website. Mm -hmm. uh, is that sammustafa.com? Yeah, one word, sammustafa.com. Um, if you are in faraway parts of the world from me, um, we have retailers in um, uh, we, down under, we got uh, Eureka Miniatures in Australia and also covers New Zealand, of course. Um, uh, Black Hat Miniatures and North Star Miniatures in, in the UK. I, I'll ship anywhere uh, in the world but from the website, but if you prefer to uh, go to a local dealer, you can check out uh, those guys. And I'm filling some uh, some other dealer orders in, in over the weekend, so we should have, you should be getting messages from your, your miniatures and, and gaming dealer of choice 
if you're on their mailing list, they'll probably send you a blurb this week with Rommel in it. In unit tiles, are you doing those online, like through drive through cards like you had in the past? No, I haven't done them yet. Um, <clears throat> right now, I've given a, 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 there's a free template I'm giving away on my website as a DIY, so you can make your own. Rommel is very open architecture. I did this a bit in Bleacher, but I've really done it in Rommel so that if you, if you want to change the game parameters, um, you can. Uh, or if you want to create a new army, for example, there's no Romanian army list for Rommel. Right? But if you really love the Romanians in World War II, everything you need in the book is there to create a Romanian army. It'll fit right into the 14 army lists that are there. And then you just download those, those DIY unit cards and you can stat up your, your Romanians. And there you go. Excellent. Wow. Why don't we move on to one of my favorite parts of the show, uh, which is our feed uh, mailbag section where we do all feedback. And so we got some feedback on Facebook. Listener Tim said of episode 189, the Great Wargaming Survey 2017 with Jasper Ortiz, uh, he said, quote, I make sure I take the survey every year. It's important to have your opinions in the mix as publishers and manufacturers pay attention to the results, unquote. Tim, I want to thank you for your feedback. And, and Sam, uh, as a publisher and a manufacturer, so to speak, uh, have you taken, are you aware of the Great Wargaming Survey mm -hmm. and, and you look at the results? Um, I haven't looked this year. Uh, I looked last year, um, and I can't remember what year I participated. I think it was two years ago that I, I, I filled it out. So yeah, we're, we're, I'm definitely aware of it. Yeah. I think it's a great thing that they do over there at WSNS, and not just for them, obviously, because it helps them to know what they should focus on as a magazine, and print has a lot of difficulties in when it comes to publishing. But I think it just it's really good for all of us as a wargaming community to be aware of what's out there. And so you might be someone who wants to get into the hobby and you don't really know what you're likely to find for people um, insofar as games. So if you look at the Great Wargaming Survey, you can see that generally in your particular country or your area, people might like to play a certain uh, era or a certain style of play. So then you can look at that and see if that is something that interests you and then see if there are people in your more local area that you can do that with. It's just, it's a really great service and I'm delighted that so many people participate in it. We also have a bit of feedback also on Facebook from listener Jay, who also commented about the same episode of the Great Wargaming Survey 2017. He said, quote, started listening to the episode today. Thanks for the shout out. Wargaming Recon is one of the inspirations for the veteran wargamer. Glad you enjoy it, unquote. So Jay, thank you also for writing in. And, and Jay is Jay Arnold. He's the host of the Veteran Wargamer. It's a fantastic podcast. One of the very few wargaming podcasts that I regularly listen to. Oddly enough, for a podcaster, I don't listen to a whole lot of podcasts, and I don't listen to a whole lot of gaming podcasts, uh, but his is one of the ones that I do, and uh, I, I suggest people check him out. And uh, Sam, I don't know if you're familiar with the show, but it's worth a listen. Um, no, I'm, I'm going to be talking to him in a couple of weeks, actually. Oh, wonderful. Oh, awesome. yeah. it, it, it's interesting how, for a long time, there hadn't been so many wargaming or even gaming podcasts, but then there's been a lot more, and I, I feel that uh, it's spread out so that we're really kind of focusing on more hyper-local stuff. So you get people popping up in different states or in different provinces in different countries, and they might do a little bit of global stuff, but then they really focus in on what is the gaming life in South Africa? What is the gaming like in um, China or, or wherever? And so they can kind of get at that. So there's more of us, and I think it just makes everyone stronger. As they say, rising tide lifts all boats. So it's pretty neat. And uh, I think you can have a great time on a show. Uh, we're gonna be going on sometime in September but I'm not quite sure when, but uh, there's going to be a group of us, I think, and it should be a lot of fun. Yeah. He, he runs a good show. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And then we just have a few announcements to share with everyone. I want to remind everyone about our Facebook group. You can get the link to that in the show notes. Just kind of a place for people to hang out, kind of like Sam, like your um, bulletin board that you have online. And instead of doing that, we have a Facebook group so people can just kind of chat, anything gaming, they can talk about, uh, stuff with the show and all that kind of things. And we just have all sorts of different discussions going on there. So I think people will enjoy that. And we have an update about the Roku channel. So for those of you who don't know, we are also part of the Nerd Broadcasting Network, which is going to bring video to the masses. <laughs> and so we're starting off with the Roku channel and they're working on that. There's some funding and grants that's coming in, just taking a little bit longer for that to happen. So things are being delayed and they're hoping by winter of 2017 that the Roku channel will be out and then you'll be able to see me uh, on your TV. I don't know why you want to look at me, but you might. 
you want to look at Sam. You want to look at him instead. Look at Adrian uh, <laughs> instead of me. So, I'll definitely want to look at me. Yeah, absolutely. So you'll see that. And we'll have all sorts of content on there. We'll be doing the show. So you'll be able to see interviews like this. You'll be able to see reviews. We'll do how-tos and tutorials and actual play content and all of that kind of stuff. So that should be pretty neat. And when we have more information, we will release that to you. You can also help support the show by becoming a member of the Wargaming Recon Army. You can go to Patreon to do that. Wargamingrecon.com slash Patreon. Costs as little as $1 per month. And I want to thank some of our Wargaming Recon Army members, Patrick and Kyle from Vermont, for your support and being part of the community. If you become a member, you get episodes before non-members. You get exclusive content. And then there's all sorts of other rewards. We do things like uh, special Wargaming Recon dice. And we have gift things that are coming out, kind of like a loot crate sort of stuff. Uh, with t-shirts and just all sorts of stuff. So you can check that out there and see all that. And then I want to remind you all also about the show notes, wargamingrecon.com slash WR192. That'll have all the things we talked about and links and everything. And Sam, before we end the episode, how can people stay in touch with you? How can they buy all your games and just see what all new stuff is that you're going to be working on? So uh, my website is sammustafa.com. I also have a, a Facebook page, Sam Mustafa Publishing, LLC. Um, I have a personal Facebook page, but the, uh, the announcements, you know, come from usually from the, the business page. Um, I do have a forum, uh, or I will on Monday, hopefully, when we fix that. It died in the website crash when the customers crashed the website yesterday, and um, there's some compatibility problem on the database. I can't get it fixed till Monday. So actually, it's been a blessing in disguise. I haven't had to answer a bunch of questions there because I've been packing like crazy for the orders. But we'll have the forum back up. From from the, the home page of my website, you just click on forum, and it'll, it'll take you to that. Yeah. Um, and then if you want, you can get on the mailing list. Um, that's uh, done for every, every point of buys a, a game unless they, they check the box saying, no, don't, don't put me on the mailing list. But you can also just contact me from the bottom of the website. Fantastic. I would encourage people to do all of those things. And uh, I want to say that it's been a delight to have you on the show, Sam. And no, thank you. I hope we can have you back. Uh, we'll find a reason uh, after we play Rommel. If we play Rommel, yeah. which... and since we're on the topic of Rommel and podcasting, can I just do one um, one other suggestion for Please. listeners? If you if you want, I do um, I do podcasts as well, audio podcasts, and the last three have been about Rommel, including a how to play. And if you want to sort of check the game out and walk through the rules, the second of those three podcasts is called How to Play Rommel. Go to the the website, and you can download the gadgets free. And you can sort of walk with me through the sequence of play and walk with me through a sample scenario. And we talk about how to, how to go through um, what, what the scales mean and so on and how to go through the numbers of the game. And it's about 20 minutes. And you can get a good sense of how to play the basic game. Really, you should be able to play the game from that moment um, with the gadgets for free and, and the podcast. Awesome. Yeah, we'll have a link to that in the show notes. So you, you should definitely check that out. Uh, I know I will because I'm very intrigued by the game and excited that it's here. And it'd be nice to get a little bit of uh, how-to from you, Sam, as creators before we dive in. Maybe it'll prevent me from making my normal mistakes when I get into a new game. No. No, probably not, but I can hope. <laughs> oh, uh, thank you again, Sam, for being on this episode of Wargaming Recon. Thanks it's for the invite. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure, really. And I want to thank all of our listeners for taking the time out of their very busy schedules to listen to this episode of Wargaming Recon. Remember, no matter how busy you are, no matter what you're doing, no matter how much time you want to spend painting figures for Rommel, you know that you have to, you gotta, you need to keep on gaming.